see all you guys. I haven't been at a, a Back to the Future uh, uh, gathering for quite some time. I worked on the ride quite a, quite a few years ago. Uh, but I, it was fantastic walking in here. I told my daughter, AJ, she's right over there wearing the Save the Clock Tower t-shirt. Yay, AJ. I told her, I said, count how many Marty's you can. And she, she's still counting. So if you're, if you're dressed as Marty, raise your hand. Let me see you guys. Oh, look at that. You guys are into it. I love it. It's fantastic. So uh, when I started at Universal, I actually started as a tour guide, all right? I was one of 11 people hired out of 500 that applied in the winter of 1991. So that tells you where, where I was in the thing. I just came out of college. And when I got the job, we had to go around on the tour and do these little pencil tours, right? Where you hold up a pencil like you're holding up a microphone and you get the tour, like you're like, hey, we do here. And they sit there and they look at you, and it's one person on the tram staring at you, giving the tour. No pressure. It's much easier to talk to all of you guys. The one guy sitting there going, nope, you missed that. Nope, you missed that. Nope. No, that was okay. Yeah, that was pretty good. Nope, you missed that. But we had the, the luxury of getting that job. And I'll tell you, even to this day, I've had a lot of jobs in the industry. I've been a producer and a director, and I still have my own production company. We're still doing stuff. I just finished a feature film we're in post-production on. But I'll tell you, after all the hundreds and hundreds of jobs that I've done in, this, in the industry over the last 20 some odd years, I've never had as much fun as I did working on the back lot that first summer as a tour guide, and I'll tell you why, is because I got to meet with all of you. And you guys, I'm telling you, especially as Back to the Future fans, are the best fans that I have ever <laughs> We had our production office for Back to the Future, the ride. And, and, okay, so how many of you have been actually on the tour at Universal Studios, right? Most of you guys, okay. In Florida. So, in, in Florida, okay. All right, so, so I worked in Hollywood. And we actually built the ride in Hollywood after the ride was built in Florida, okay? So we actually got to learn from some of their mistakes. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But we had our offices in a production trailer in the parking lot of where they fixed up the tram. So when a tram would break down, they would bring it into the tram garage and they would bring it by us. Well, at the same time, they had all the old cars from all the movies that you can imagine and a few other things, too, that were in the parking lot next to us. So, I mean, to the point where we had all three DeLoreans lined up, all three hero DeLoreans lined up right outside our door. You know, the big white walls falling apart and all that. I mean, it was just, it was, and we didn't know it at the time, because remember, this is 1992 that we were building the ride. We opened it in 93, and I remember 93 because we opened the ride in the morning, and in the evening, that same day, we got to go see Jurassic Park in the Hitchcock Theater. Where it was mixed, and man, it blew us away. That was one of the best days. I mean, you talk about a red letter date in history. That was a cool day. That was a cool day. But I remember the fans always would come by on the tram, and they would freak out because we hung a sign outside our office that said "Misused Cars." <laughs> <laughs> and he had, we had the DeLoreans, we had Biff's 1955 car, 300 bucks, right? We had, I mean, there, there, were, there were so many different vehicles that we had all lined up in various states of either repair or disrepair or on the way to becoming something else. And I knew I was in the right business when we were setting up the office, and this is a time where we were still tearing down Battlestar Galactica, okay? Where a coworker of mine, he said, because I started as a runner there, okay? I went from being the tour guide to a runner. I was making copies and putting coffee pots and, you know, doing all those things. But my gosh, I was working on Back to the Future, and it was the movie that, like, all of you guys inspired me and inspired me to get into business. I'm like, I'm freaking out here. This is awesome. I am a runner on a property having to do with Back to the Future. It was the greatest day of my life. My coworker said, Dave, come on, we gotta go work. I said, all right, what are we doing? So we gotta move the shark closer to the time machine. <laughs> and that's how I knew I was in the right business. <laughs> so we did. The, the old mechanical jaws shark was still there. It's now probably in some disarray in some, uh, some junkyard Van Nuys. But at that time, it was right outside our, our car, or right, right outside our office. So when we started building the ride, it was, so, I don't know if you guys know the lot very well, but you know the building where it is now, right? So, that building is like 13 stories high, 14 stories high, and we had to demolish the building for Battlestar Galactica, and as part of that, we got to go in with our masks and our gloves and tear out all the silos. <laughs> 
it was a tragic day, really. You know, as you hold a Cylon in your hand. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I know your life has been good, but it's over now. You know, these vacuum-formed face masks on the robots, you know, and they all went in the trash. And then that building got demolished, and then we laid groundwork on the building that would eventually become back to the future of the ride. Now, what's interesting is that during that time, we had a schedule based on what the ride had taken to build in Florida. So my job, again, cleaning coffee pots, making copies, running around a lot, I mean, it was great because not only as a tour guide did we have sort of the keys to the, to the kingdom at Universal at that time, pre-9-11, pre-Black Tower shooting, pre-all pre that kind of stuff. So we could pretty much go on whatever sets we wanted to go. We just needed to make a call, hey, I'm going to come on this set, is that, is that cool? So at the same time, we're running around the lot just playing fanboys, going on to everything. I mean, I, was, I got to go on the set of Jurassic Park. I got to go on the set of Fall 13. I mean, there's nothing cooler than driving as, as like, I'm supposed to be delivering copies to that building, but I'm going to go over here to the sound stage. And, I'm gonna see it. <laughs> and here come the dinosaurs, right? Under cover of night, these giant tarps. And there's the Brachiosaur, and there's the T-Rex, and there's all this other stuff. It was a trip. It was a golden time in that. And, and because time is such a, 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 an integral part of what we do here at Back to the Future, and why we, we continue to love this thing, it is such a, t I mean, you guys remember where you were when you got hooked, right? I mean, think back. When's the first time you saw Back to the Future? When did it flip your mind? 1985. 1985. Right? And like any other thing in life, when you get hooked on something, you remember where you were. I remember I was in a, I was in a movie theater in the Bay Area where I grew up, and we had a teacher's strike, and we bailed out of school to go see the movies. So it was me and my buddy were like, we're going. We're just, they don't know what they're doing. We're going to go do our thing. So flash forward now, right? We're on the lot of Universal, and here come the DeLoreans. And here comes all the people saying, okay, this is going to be our grand plan. And there were a lot of engineers, and there were a lot of people, different people that were like, okay, we're, this is how we're going to do this. So the building went up first, okay? And oftentimes you think, well, we should build the ride, and then the building, and then first the building. It's like the chicken and the egg, right? So if you guys remember having ridden the ride, there were 12 cars in each dome. You guys remember that? Okay, so when we built the domes, we built them to spec where the opening was built based on the schematics for the crane that we were going to use to lift the cars into place. So imagine this, right? The building is just constructed steel and cement and all this stuff. I mean, we poured cement for like three weeks, just the truck, just constant pour to get the foundation for this thing. And then, here comes this big giant champion crane, big yellow thing, and we're, we're driving it into the building. And imagine, right, so these two rails, okay, are the, are the, are the opening for the, for, the, for the crane. And here comes this 100 tons of crane coming into the building. And it, I kid you not, I've got a video of this, VHS still, on video. There was like a quarter inch of space <laughs> on either side of the crane. And it took us like six hours to get the crane in there. Nope, 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 nope. Come back up. Okay, you're good. So then the crane lives inside the building. Well, now you gotta get cars, right? So we built the cars at a place called Task Research, which is up in the Santa Paula Airport. You guys know where Santa Paula is? Okay, it's near Valencia, it's between the, anyway, it's about an hour and a half north of LA. There was a fiberglass shop called Task Research. They built airplanes. So get this, we gotta take that, 24 different cars, DeLoreans, right? Eight passenger DeLoreans. We've gotta take them from Santa Paula, by way of Valencia, to Universal Studios, in a big flatbed truck. <laughs> The looks we got going down the freeway with stacks of DeLoreans on the back of the truck was awesome. It was just flat awesome. Because, like, okay, if we don't make this, if we don't get there on time, then, you know, the, the world will end. But we had, we had so much fun bringing them in and then putting them on, getting the ride ready, Oh, uh, here's, here's one thing for you. The scissor lift. Oh, so, so you guys know when you're in the garage, right? You get in there and then you get lifted up into the dome. You guys know how that worked? 
So you get in the car, the doors come down, the lights go, the fog blows over you, the music goes, and all of a sudden the lights come up and bam, you're in this giant dome going crazy, right? Following Doc. The way that that worked is we had the cars in a garage and there was this 180 foot dome, Omnimax dome, way up there. Well, in order to get the cars from the garage up in there, we had to elevate the cars, right? So we had a motion-based simulator on top of a scissor lift, and the scissor lift would go like this, and it would lift the cars up out of the garage into the dome. At which time, life would go nuts, right? It would be awesome film and everything else. Well, the motion base that was on top of the scissor lift was a Navy flight simulation motion base. So, if you've been on Back to the Future of the Ride, you've pretty much been an Maverick in Top Gun. <laughs> so congratulations for that. But, because they were, there were three settings on the motion base, the ride that you, most of you have experienced was the middle setting. The slow setting was how we tested it. When you get on a scissor lift and a motion base and you're testing this giant dome for the very first time, you go, well, is this going to work? I don't know. Let's try it slow. <laughs> so you get in there, and this literally was like this. Wow, dog. This is exciting. <laughs> Most of you experienced the middle one, which was cool. And not unlike uh, you know, some of the other violent roller coasters around. I mean, it really packed a punch sometimes, right? There was a high setting, <laughs> which we had to test. <laughs> and it was one of the most painful things I've ever experienced. <laughs> you know how the lap bars come down, right? On most rides, you go, uh, yeah, I kind of need that. If we didn't have that, we would end up outside. <laughs> it was to the point where it was so violent. We were being whack, whack, and forth, and, and, and then when you stop and you come your foot, and you would knock the wind out. <laughs> Flash forward, June 12, 1993, the ride opens. In the control booth, there's monitors, okay? When you go in the control booth, you can see every single ride vehicle. You can see every single person riding this ride, right? Big, giant smiles, people doing this, freaking out, whatever, okay? Kids just like, Woo! their parents are like, I'm gonna die. <laughs> there was one car, somehow, some way, I don't know how, I wasn't a part of it, that got left on the high seven. <laughs> We got letters, <laughs> we got complaints, we got written up. This is the most violent ride. How can they possibly make a ride like this for families? They're going to be killing children. <laughs> and that's where protein spill on car nine oh. came to live. So we fixed that problem pretty quickly. <laughs> but if you ever have the chance, I highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, man. You know, the building was built uh, at Universal over a giant methane pocket. <laughs> I kid you not, we had drills about what to do if you got overpowered by some methane release. We're all looking at each other like, is that you? Is that you? We had chances to play laser tag in the building before it was over. Oh, nice. 13 floors. I got you! So, as a runner, I did all kinds of things for the job. I got promoted about midway through my term there, which was about two years that we, that we built the ride, to uh, a production coordinator, and then to kind of a creative guy. And so I would help design with our designer, John Krieger, and build all the cages that Doc Brown had on each floor. Do you guys remember Doc's little laboratories on each side? Yeah. The talking clam. Right? The bicycles. I don't know. I forget now everything we put into there. But here's how it all came down. We had a graphic designer. We had a guy named Norm Kahn. He was, I don't know if you guys know Norm Kahn. But he was one of our, he was one of our, our managers of Scenics and everything else. He knew I was a fan. He said, Dave, think like Doc. Awesome. Are you going to pay me for this? Work with this guy, John Krieger, who's an artist and an illustrator, and build the laboratories. I said, well, okay, are there any sort of creative, uh, you know, parameters? He's like, no, just go nuts, have fun with it. You just gotta stay within this, this certain budget. 
I, I, I mean, this is a job, people. <laughs> so for six months, I would do things like go on Craigslist in the morning and find cool stuff. And I would drive, and I would get roll top desks, load it in the back of my truck, bring it back to the building, grab another couple of PAs, bring them up there. And slowly but surely, we built all the scenics for Doc. And it's awesome when you get to be on the phone and you call up a guy and you say, hey, listen, uh, I know you made these things that are LED panels that scroll. We have a talking plan, and we need to hear his thoughts. Can you help us out? So we made friends all over town. There was a guy named Larry Albright who created all the, the neon that you see. And we went down to his store in Santa Monica, and Larry, you walk into the door, and it looked, Larry was Doc Brown. You, you come into his place, and there's acres and acres and acres of glass tubes that reach the ceiling, all looking like Tesla, right? With the, the stuff going everywhere. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. So again, you're trucking tons and tons of cool stuff. At one point, I had my truck full of almost every single Back to the Future 2 prop. Hoverboards, Doc's... Radiation suits, Marty's little guitar from the opening of the movie. They were all there. And it was the kind of thing like, man, I wish I, wish I had known then what I know now in terms of what it would become. I, I think I would have just driven left <laughs> instead of right. All right, I got a little trivia for you guys. This is going to blow your mind. So after we were done with the, with the scenics, I, I kept telling my boss, Steve Marvel was his name. I kept telling him, I said, man, I guess I'm in this business. I want to direct. I want to tell stories. I want to be a filmmaker. I want to say, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. Clean coffee pots, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow, same thing. I want to do that. Okay, I get it. I get it. So at one point, Universal came to us, and they said, listen, we're expecting this ride to be really big in Hollywood, bigger than, even though it was, than it was in Florida. So we need something to extend the queue line video to entertain the people while they're in line. We don't have a lot of budget, we don't have a lot of money, but we need this. So my boss came to me and he said, how would you like to do it? I said, yes, <laughs> thank you, yes. Which really more sounded like, are you nuts? Bring me, come on, let's do it, let's do it. And he says, all right, let me, let me pitch you. Let's see, let's see what happens. So he came back the next week and I'm just all giddy. He comes back next week and he says, Dave, you're fired. What? That's not supposed to. He says, and you're rehired as the director of the Q1 video. <laughs> It was one of those moments that I remember, and I still have the check, my very first check as a director, hanging on my wall at home. And I remember walking onto the lot, just standing a little bit tall, you know? And I'm like, man, this is, this is, I was just, I was very, very grateful. And so that began a long-term relationship with Universal, where they introduced me to Bob Gale. And Bob, is, Bob became a friend, still was a friend. And, you know, for me, at that point, right, early 20s going, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever, to now be introduced to Bob Gale, to say, yeah, work with Bob and come up with something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Gale. What would you like, Mr. Gale? Absolutely, Mr. Gale. He said, no, 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 come on, let's think about this. Let's come up with some ideas and what we can do. Well, we were limited because we didn't have a whole big budget. And so we had to get creative about how to do it. And so we would write these little scripts and figure it out and bounce it back and forth to Bob. And he said, well, we don't really have the money to, to, to shoot new stuff because the stuff with Doc Brown and uh, you see with the hover cam and all that stuff, that had already, already been done for Florida, right? A guy named Les Mayfield, Zaluna Mayfield. Yeah, they had a company that used to do all Spielberg behind the scenes. So he had done that. And then anybody know the name Peyton Reed by any chance? Right, he just directed Ant-Man. <coughs> So Peyton and I used to do electronic press kits for Zalou Mayfield after the ride of the bill, but Peyton, at this time, had taken over for less and had, had directed some of that Back to the Future pre-show as well. So now I'm getting to hang out with all these guys, and I'm getting to actually bounce ideas and create stuff and, and come up with things. And so they dumped all the making of footage, literally. They came in with boxes and boxes of three-quarter inch tape, and they said, here you go, Dave, make something out of it. Right? We don't have the money to shoot anything new, so let's get creative with something we, that we can do. So not only did we put together new featurettes and go really dive, dive back into all the behind the scenes stuff, 
But they said, well, we got a little bit of money, we can do some CGI. We can do some, you know, remember, this is 92. I mean, what's CGI, right? Here's the CGI guy. But I had a guy that I met at USC, a friend of mine, named Rob Letterman. Now, Rob, at that time, was doing a senior thesis film at USC based on the Silver Surfer. So I got to stand in for the Silver Surfer with him. And, you know, they painted over the top of me and did that whole thing. And then when I had a need, I said, hey, Rob, I really want to do this thing where we fly through the building, right? And we can have our hover cam kind of find people, right? The Institute of Future Technology and Doc can come in and say, hey, I'm looking for this guy. And this, you know, we can do this thing. And the Institute had this sort of life to it, right? It had the center to it. It had the voice of the Institute of Future Technology. And we're searching for Dr. David DeVos, and your four-dimensional footage is ready, and, right? And it was all kind of stuff that was created to be able to do within there. So Rob said, yeah, we can do that, we can do that. So he was doing this, the, the stuff in the USC lab, right? And then we'd take it home and work on his Quadra 950 at night. When we were done with that, because he had an architect friend and so on, they came up, I said, hey, come on to the ride, come on, I want to show you guys before we, we do this, right? So he would come up, he brought his little friend up, you know, he had glasses and wiry hair, and he's like, he was all into it, and there was this other guy who was really tall and just like, oh, shit, it's okay, I see that, I see that. And then there was another guy who was kind of a kind of an Englishman, and he was like, oh, this, you know, show me the show me the sound system. I won't see the sound system. He was all in the sound system. I said, well, what do you guys do? And the little guy was like, oh, I'm a writer, I'm a writer. Okay, and big tall guy, I'm an architect. The guy, the English guy, he's all a musician. Well, so we got to work with these guys, and I only found out later the musician was Thomas Dolby. Huh? Right? She blinded me with science. Right? And these are the moments that you have where you're like, your 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 whole world is sort of changing a little bit. So when Rob had done all the CGI, and it was great, because I had another friend who worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, like NASA, right, in Pasadena. He said, yeah, come on by. We won't tell him you're here. Just bring your little camera. So we got to go all over JPL, like shooting all these scientific things, right, like they were the Institute of Future Technology. So when you see the hover cam flying through, that's JPL. They didn't know it. Because <laughs> we gagged it up. So we got a little bit of CGI done. We got some hover cam footage. We got a few other things. And then I said, well, Rob, you know, can you help me out? Because I've got to do sound for this, right? And again, we're working with very low, limited budgets. So he said, oh, yeah, I've got to get a sound. The writer guy you met, you know, he has sound effects. Let's go over to his house. So we go over to his house in Brentwood. And I'm like, wow, it's a nice house. Let's walk in and say, you know, it's your parents' house. No, it's my place. <laughs> Pretty good. So we go down to his basement. Really great basement, right? He's got all the synthesizers set up and the old Macs and everything else. And his whole thing is lined with LPs. Right? All this classic vinyl. And they're like all these soundtracks. And he's so excited. He pulls one down off the shelf and he says, You gotta check this one out. This is my favorite. Slumber Party Massacre Part 3. <laughs> the whole thing was done with a Casio CZ 101 in a, in a wine glass. <laughs> so he proceeded to do our sound effects and a lot of the music and whatever. So when you go up to the ride and you see all this stuff and you hear all this stuff, I want you to think about this. That guy was J.J. Abrams. <laughs> He's done pretty well for himself. <laughs> pretty well for himself. So that, was a, that was a trip, and one of those trivia moments that most people don't know about. They said J.J. did the sound effects for the pre-show edition to Back to the Future the <laughs> Ride. Yeah, pretty cool. Last time I talked to him, he was on Alias. He was a little busy. <laughs> a little bit busy. Oh man. So yeah, there, uh, there are so many different stories about the ride that I could, I could go on and on and on and tell you guys. Um, I mean, we had, we had such great fun. There was such a great, great team uh, working on the ride to extend the story. And that was, that was what was really important to us, was to take this idea and shepherd it and really be the curators of, of this thing that Bob's, the, the Bob's had created. And it, it, was, it was such a privilege. And it was the, the kind of thing where it only happens once in a lifetime, where you get to actually enter the world of something that you were such a fan of and, and help to extend that, even just a little bit. And the ride still lives in Japan, albeit only for another few months, from what I understand. No! Uh, no. It was a hard day for all of us when the Simpsons came and took over. Uh, I mean, it was really tough. You know, I, I, I mean, there were things, I remember behind the screen, okay, and you guys remember how big that screen was? I mean, you know, the Simpsons is still there. Same, same There was a ladder behind the screen, and 
we used to go when you, you know, if you looked at the screen really closely, there were always little holes in the screen, little pinholes, right, to let it breathe. And we used to climb that ladder behind the screen and look through the screen to everybody riding the ride. <laughs> and it was some of the greatest moments. These things were fantastic because you got to see the joy on everybody's faces, right? And, and it was the kind of thing where it's like, you know, this is why we make movies. This is why we are fans of stories. This is why it's not just because, oh, the cool technology, and oh, hey, look, let's go back in time or whatever. But it's about those personal connections. You know, I'm guessing that each and every single one of you here has a personal connection to Back to the Future, right? It's, it, it's a time in your life. There are people that you love that you shared this moment with. And to me, that's the whole point of entertainment, right? It's that collective experience. You know, if we're on our phones like this, yeah, it's, it's, it's a new world. I get it. But there's nothing like being in a room full of people experiencing the same thing, going, we're doing this. And that's what it was, time and time again. And what was so cool about it is that you had a new audience like every 10 minutes, right? And it never got old. There were times where we used to go up behind the ride and we used to look side to side. There was a little platform where we could walk out and the cars had come up on the scissor lifts and you could actually stand between the cars on the top level and look down and see everybody experiencing the ride. And sometimes we would just sit up there on our off hours and just listen. We just listen to the crowd, all the screams and the people who were experiencing the first times. And, the, you know, the people, there was, I remember one guy going, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> these little things just stick in your mind. And that ride launched part of my career. I mean, what's cool is that I had the opportunity to develop a relationship with the university where we didn't have to get to do commercials through my production company on the back lot. We're in pre-production on one right now. We're going to shoot in November. But for those of you who might have seen the Universal Studios advertisement with the tram and the high flight and the guy with the big firewall, right, and all the cops down below, you know, we, we got to do that. I got to direct that shoot. And it's one of those things where it's like I still pinch myself sometimes, you know? And it, it's like I was a tour guide going, man, I want to shoot on this lot. Man, I want to work on this lot. Man, I want to do these kinds of things. And then to be able to come full circle and not only work on Back to the Future, but extend that relationship and continue to work with these people, these great people that have developed relationships over time. And then to see them coming by, to see the trams coming by now and stopping while I yell action and the whole place blows up. I'm not looking at the explosion. I'm looking at the tram going, you like it? <laughs> so in some ways, I'm still that tour guy back in the <laughs> So thank you guys. I appreciate it. So I'm, uh, I'm totally open to questions, if you guys have questions. And the only thing I will not tell you, or that I will tell you, is that I have no control on over whether or not we bring back the ride. <laughs> Almost that question. Seeing as it's still the Simpsons ride is still basically the same thing, but the gullwing doors and the screen and everything, you know, is it possible they can just press play and run the Back to the Future ride? Well, when you and press play and they run the Back to the Future ride, there's a whole bunch of people that say, pay me, pay me now. Uh, right? <laughs> so, like anything in our world. Um, there were, there, it, it's funny because the ride system itself is very much the same thing. I mean, it is, you know, you swap out the film, it's become a digital projector. It used to be the big 70 millimeter projector. Wow. I mean, I remember being in the booth hearing that thing run, you can hardly hear yourself. You know, and the heat that it generated and all the rest of it. Now it's just, you literally press play. So, in the future, I'm sure it will become different, you know, something different than The Simpsons. Um, I'm not a giant fan, I gotta say. Um, only because I feel like they, they take my, took, you know, took my baby and like, Painted over, you know, with some gone. So, but I'm sure. I mean, we built the building in order to last many, 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 many years, and so I'm sure there will be some iteration in there at some point. It's different than the Simpsons. Yeah, over. Okay. I've heard that there was rumor that there might have been a Back in the Future ride part two. That was going to happen. They were maybe thinking about kind of continuing. I've never heard that. No, first time I've ever heard that. The rumor of it, whether or not there would have been a Back to the Future ride part two, and that's the first I've heard of it. Okay. I would love it. That'd be awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Let's see me after. <laughs> I got some ideas. We got some ideas. Pitch <laughs> them. Uh, well, you guys know that Bob's and Bob, they, they're never going to let a, another Back to the Future be made, right, in their lifetimes. So, <laughs> yeah, Bob, Bob's and 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 I was talking to somebody earlier, uh, Michael, are you in the house? Are you saying, you know, we should, we should start a theme park with all the rides that have been closed? That yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sign me up. 
You know, it's funny when uh, you talk about rebuilding the ride. When we when we built the ride in Hollywood, for Florida, there was the, the motion bases themselves. You know, I was telling you about being so violent. Um, the scissor lifts themselves were underbuilt, and so one of them during testing cracked. Obviously, that can lead to some issues. Um, so we had to double the steel in the in the scissor lifts. But one of my favorite things was. We, we introduced into the hydraulics something called frequency injection, where we took a sound frequency, like static, and we introduced that electronically into the hydraulic system. And so if the hydraulics are going along normally, right, if you're a sine wave who's doing this, now all of a sudden you, you, you introduce this kind of a and that's what you felt at the end of the ride. Well, the whole building would shudder because you have 24 scissor lifts all at the same time. You're like, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> And at the end of the ride cycle, we had to go do so much testing, so much metallurgic testing on the scissor lifts to make sure that all that frequency injection didn't once again bust the steel like it did. So I think about the concept of, of a long-term project like that and the maintenance that goes into it. You know, we all think, man, I'd love to have this thing in my backyard. And I don't think what? <laughs> what? Yeah. I have a story somewhere that uh, Spielberg was involved in the original ride in Florida, and uh, when it went in, it was kind of a stationary ride. He said he really wanted it to, to move around and, and buck around a little bit. So you know more about that? Well, I, I do, actually. Uh, the, the question is about Steven Spielberg and what was his involvement in the ride. You know, Steven was actually integral in coming up with the idea of the ride. I mean, it really was a brainstorm session with him. You know, he's, he, he makes a tremendous amount of money just as a consultant for Universal Studios. I mean, he has a long-term yearly contract with Universal for $50 million a year just to get results. Okay, so you think about Steven and the kind of money he makes, think about that just as a base level, okay? Just like, yeah, I'll show up and give my nod to that. So it is true. I mean, he had a lot to do with the creation and the, the simulation aspect. And remember, I mean, at the time we built the ride, that was, it was so new. It was so fresh. It was, I mean, Star Tours had been out, but to do something with, with this many vehicles, with this particular property, with that kind of a dome, I mean, Star Tours was a, a screen, and, you know, basically attached to the front of your ride vehicle. This was a completely different concept. So there were a lot of iterations created with planning and development, which since went on to be uh, universal creative. At the time, it was called PD. And I remember. I remember one morning, the guy who, the same boss, Steve Marble, who gave me the opportunity to come in and direct and sort of change the path of my career. He called me up one day, and he was on, I was on the, I was in the building doing something, and he called me on the radio, because we were kind of fanboys together, you know, he was my boss, but he was a fanboy too, also a filmmaker. And he calls me and he says, Greg, hey, get over here. <laughs> I said, okay, what's up? So I show up, and he's like, don't say anything, just come with me. All right. Like, what, am I in trouble? Am I going to get, what's the deal? So we go over to the elevators, we go downstairs, and for those of you who know, Steven Spielberg will not go in an elevator. He's terrified. Won't go in an elevator. In fact, he made us let him off the Jurassic Park ride before the drop off. Right. <laughs> Stop the ride. That must be nice. Right. <laughs> must be nice. Do whatever you want on the ride. Get away with your car. So, so I'm standing there at the base of the elevator, and here comes this white man driving up. It's the handy passenger. Out pops Jeffrey Katzenberg, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve's like, just, just hang with us. You're part of this team. Just hang. And so Steven, 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 Dave, Dave, Jeffrey, Dave, 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 Dave. And we got to take on the ride. And I mean, you guys probably know by now, but I'm a fan too. <laughs> right? And so I'm sitting literally behind Steven Spielberg as he's turning around and talking to Steve Marvel. And he's he's like hardly watching the ride. He's like this. He's like, oh you know, when the dinosaur swallowed him, he's like, oh yeah, I remember when we did that, that was awesome. And this is going like, oh you should check it out. Oh, it was a lava fall, you're gonna love this. Okay, we got <laughs> And that was that was Spielberg. He was as much of a fanboy as all of us. He was so excited. He was so excited to see how the thing had come together. And of course he'd ridden it in Florida, he knew, but it was like he was riding it for the first time. It was awesome. It was very cool. Yeah. Uh, sort of talking about the extended queue video, was, uh, did you have anything to do with sort of the green screen shots with uh, Doc Brown? 
Uh, sorry, Doc. Doc, call the march. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Uh, that was all done at ZM Productions. That was done by Peyton, all that, all that stuff, right before I came on. And so that's how I got to know Peyton and George and Les and all that, because they had done that for the ride in Florida already. So when I came on, it was taking that and adding another 40 minutes to that stuff. But what was great is they introduced me to ZM and to, to Les and to Peyton and all that stuff. So we're all coming up with ideas. I mean, it was all the team about how to do it. And then, you know, and then they would disseminate that to us and we could work with Bob and come back and you know, work with it that way. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, up there in the middle. Oh, the styrofoam cup, yes. <laughs> yes, the styrofoam cup, the famed styrofoam cup. What was that, about 40 feet tall? The, the, well, that's, you know, Doug Trumbull did the, did the ride film uh, in Fort Florida. That was well before I came on. But, you know, there are a lot of rumors about how that cup got left there. One was a disgruntled teamster, since I'm going to mess with you people, and he left the cup. Another one was just that it was a mistake, that it was just, you know, just close. You know, and there was there was a rumor that I heard. I don't know if there's any truth to it. That it was Doug's truck. That it was Doug's cup. That he had coffee and just left it and forgot about it. But again, I mean, it's you know, these tales sort of grow taller on down the line. So, so yeah. Were there any Easter eggs or favorite moments that you had in both either the ride or that? Oh boy, there are all kinds of Easter eggs. And you, you have to understand, these Easter eggs are very personal to me, okay? <laughs> Everybody that we put up there in the queue line, in terms of the scientists that were in the Institute for Future Technology, they were all the people that work on the ride, right? When you walk in, you see the nameplates on the, on the, on the car doors as you're walking into the garages. My name was on car number two, dome number one. Yeah, so it's like, that was my car. So I mean, there are so many Easter eggs. Okay, here's a little one for you. And this is, again, an Easter egg. I don't know if it'll mean anything to everybody else, but it meant something to me. Again, because we were on a budget, we needed the voice of the Institute of Future Technology, OK? And we couldn't afford big SAG actors or voiceover or anything else. And I was like trying and trying and trying to get some name actor to do this, you know. Aging Dr. David DeVos, your footage. Now, you know that voice that you hear every time? So I punted, and I said, Steph, my wife, get over here. And we recorded the voice of the Institute of Future Technology on my little portable dad player in our apartment in Toluca Lake at 2 o'clock in the morning the night before the mix. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. And Universal said, wow, we really like her. <laughs> Hi, fun, <man. laughs> um, Boy, how many Easter eggs. I mean, in the cages on either side, there were so many Easter eggs that were there. We had, uh, you know, Bob had a couple. I mean, I don't really, really think about it on, on what there were. Um, when we had uh, when we had all the, the hover cam footage um, that would go there, we had we had Easter eggs plenty. We put in some stuff about uh, Tom Wilson, about his character. We sort of extended. If you really look, and you have to really, really look, you'll see stuff about Biff having been there before, right? Where some of the scientific equipment at JPL he had messed with. So you know that's why we haven't landed on Mars yet. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. So yeah, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was you? That's a year very soon. You're very soon. And that got cut out. That was fine. You're, you're absolutely right. That was going to be part of it. And it got cut out for, I forget what reason it did, but I think part of it was the continuity of going and having him yelling at you when the car was still coming down and Doc would take over. Um, but that actually, I believe, was in the plan. Yeah. Eagle eye. Eagle eye. Because there's never enough manure with this. <laughs> What, um, why did they open the ride in Florida first? Well, Florida at that time was, you know, I mean, they were trying to compete with Disney, right? So you have all these different attractions going on in Florida. And the, the thing about Universal Hollywood was because we started as a movie studio lot, right, first, an actual working lot, well, it started as a chicken farm, but don't get, don't get my tour guide going, okay? Don't do that. Um, they wanted to test 
they wanted to test it before. They had more space, they could build a new building, they wanted to test it, they wanted to see how it could go. Um, nobody knew, nobody knew. I mean, everybody remember, this was, this was in, uh, when was it, 90, 91, right? And so when the, when the second, third movies uh, were shot, came out in 89, 88, 89, help me with my math, the, uh, uh, nobody really understood if this concept would, would actually work. And so they built the, the, the ride there first um, because they had the space, because they wanted to use it as their marquee Florida attraction, right? Because they were trying to build up Adventure, Universal, and all that sort of thing. They figured, you know, Hollywood was a going concern just with the interest of an actual movie lot anyway. And so now, I mean, so you see the same thing now with Harry Potter and, you know, all the other stuff, Terminator 2 and, you know, a lot of the other uh, projects that have gone on. Florida has become the destination for people worldwide because they know they can go hit everything at the same time now, right? I mean, you, you do Orlando, you can be there for a month and not see everything. Uh, so that's, that's why. So, yeah. I used to uh, go back to Universal Studios way back in the 90s when it was like, yeah, that all started back at the time, and I used to be driving back to the future since uh, 94, all the way until now. So ever since when they closed down back in 2007, September 3rd, I was like very, very upset, very sad to see it go. As were we all. As were we all. No, I'm sure you're paying that. Yeah. Yeah. I've rode I've that ride like, since I was like, eight years old. That was you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I don't think it's right, but it's a great time to see So, like, because each year, I would go on, like, every different year of the month, because I don't have any pass. But ever since uh, one of the rides was gone, so I figured I must break the records, but it's 65,000 times. So it's like 65,000 times? Dude, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. What's your name? What's your name? Jason. Jason? Yeah. 65,000 times. never been higher. People coming over and now Harry Potter is going to go off the chart. I mean, off the chart. So much off the chart that they're pulling all our vendor passes for next year. Because they're expecting so many people, they don't really need to give us that anymore. So it is the kind of thing where, for all of us that love it, it's, it's, it's really too bad. For the suits and the tower, I get it. Yes. But that doesn't mean we have to give up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, two more questions. Two more questions. Very good moments. Did, did you uh, work on any other rides at Universal after that? I did. I worked on Jurassic Park, the ride, which was awesome. Thank you. Uh, I worked on Terminator 2 3D. Yeah. Which was All right, one quick little story about Terminator 2 3D, okay? We're on the set. Blowing stuff up, all that stuff, digital domain, everything else. We wrapped, we're about to watch dailies. Arnold sits right next to me. I will say how are you. Jim sits right up to him. James Cameron sits right on the other side of him. Sorry, I don't mean to do that. He sits right on the other side of him. And Arnold says, Hey Jim, about the 3D with the thing, and I'm asking you a question because I don't know about it. And like literally, camera starts explaining to him the entire history of 3D. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, taking notes right now. <laughs> it was fantastic. I mean, just to 
to sit at the feet of this guy who's just brilliant uh, in his in his mindset was fantastic. So we, I mean, I worked on a bunch of other stuff too. There were a lot of really, really great times. Really great times. Okay, last question, right? Here. Hello, the ride. I should have said nothing to do with you, but awesome. Good night, everybody. <laughs> You know, remember what I was telling you about earlier about the suits? So that was a that was a chicken joint to begin with back in the day. So let's you know let's slap a new cover on it. That's Doc Fried Chicken. Not much more than that. But you'll be happy to know that it is now gone. Don't order Doc Fried Chicken. What's that? It's somebody else's chicken. It's somebody else's chicken. But now when you walk just past that, you will you will now enter Hogwarts. And I just have to tell you, having to have a little sneak of it, it's awesome. It is really, really something. You guys are going to be happy.